Good morning, happy Sabbath. Please find a Bible this morning and open to the book of 1 Corinthians, where we just read. 1 Corinthians 13. I'm wondering what name you would associate with the phrase, I'm the greatest. How about float like a butterfly and sting like a bee? I'm the greatest. Automatically, as I could hear from your response, it means former boxing heavyweight champion Muhammad Ali. Some of you may not know that a number of years ago, Muhammad Ali bought an estate very near Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan, where our church seminary is to train pastors for the work. When he was living in Berrien Springs, well, he lived there for over 30 years before moving to Scottsdale, Arizona where he died in 2016 after a more than 30-year battle with Parkinson's disease at the age of 74. It's estimated that in his career, he absorbed over 200,000 hits in the boxing ring. So a lot of uh, medical experts believe that certainly contributed to his Parkinson's, if not the outright cause. Well, when he was living in Berrien Springs, one of the ministerial students at Andrews University drove past the gate of Ali's estate one day. And then as he drove into town, he saw that Ali's personal bus was parked downtown outside a restaurant. And this fellow got to talking with the bus driver and being rather aggressive, he finally decided he would go in and try to get Ollie's autograph. When asked later what he learned from his encounter with the champion, he said, what I learned was, I think he really means it. He really thinks he is the greatest. Now, nobody would have wanted to tell him face to face, but I can say today, taint so. 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and the 13th verse. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Love is the greatest. The greatest of these is charity. Love is the greatest. I'd like us to spend just a moment, first of all, defining our terms that we'll be using throughout this series. I would like to redefine with you two basic old time-worn religious words, the word sin and the word love. I would like to suggest to you this morning that sin is simply self-centeredness. If I were to ask for a definition of sin, I'm sure that some of you would say, well, sin is a transgression of the law, which is the direct quote, of course, from 1 John 3, verse 4. And of course, that's very true, and yet it's somewhat of a limited definition because the phrase, sin is the transgression of the law, infers that sin is an act. Jesus is, oh, no, no, no. Sin begins with an attitude. He made it very clear in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. He talked about adultery as being the act, but being preceded by lust, by the thought, by the attitude. And then he went on to talk about murder, killing, being the act, but beginning with anger, with the attitude. And what is the attitude with which sin begins? Selfishness. 
Sin is self-centeredness. All sin is selfishness. All selfishness is sin. The book Education, page 226, says, Selfishness is the root of all evil. Did you think it was money? Not so. Of course, 1 Timothy 6.10 says, The love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money indicates selfishness. And this most sobering thought from volume eight of Testimonies to the Church, page 140, not one selfish person will be found in heaven. Amen. That's quite a comment. Not one selfish person will be found in heaven. That's what will make it heaven. The fact that we're there and nobody has any selfishness. Sin is self-centeredness. This, I think, is what separates the sheep from the goats, the saved from the lost. You know, Matthew, Jesus and Matthew 25 talks about the great judgment when God Almighty sits on his throne and he judges everyone that has ever lived and he places all of the righteous, the sheep as he calls them, on his right hand and all of the goats, the unrighteous, on his left hand. And the distinguishing mark between those who are saved and those who are not saved those who live for others and those who live selfishly. That's the difference. These aren't the people that keep the Sabbath and these are people that keep another day. These aren't, you know, people that believe in this doctrine and these are the ones that don't. The ones who give of themselves are the ones who are saved and the ones who are ultimately lost are the ones who live selfishly. And so our other word is love. Love is the opposite. Love is other-centeredness. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're beginning this morning what will be a three-part series on the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Starting now with the verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Charity. And preachers have been interpreting that over the years for decades and saying, well, charity means love. And while that is true, I'm not so sure that it works, especially today. Because love today too often means attraction, or it means lust, or it means sex. And love today is something with which you sell anything from soap to cigarettes, from diamonds to beer. I'm not so sure, but that this Greek word agape is better translated perhaps by charity as it is in the King James Version that I read. Because charity means giving. And love is giving. Charity means not only giving, it means giving to the needy. If I give something to my friend whom I hope will return something back to me in the way of friendship, that's not charity. If I love someone whom I find instinctively attracted to, that is not agape love. The word charity suggests giving to those in need. The true godly love is loving the unlovely just like Jesus did. It is giving myself in love to those who are short on love without regard to reward. Love is other-centeredness. Martin Luther King once said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? 
Love is other-centeredness. To sum it up, I guess the ultimate example would be the difference between Christ and Satan, the great controversy, the ultimate examples of good and evil. Satan said in Isaiah 14, I will be exalted. Sin is self-centeredness. But of Jesus, it was said, he lived to bless others. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Love is other-centeredness. It is giving. When I was in college, there was one student in several of my classes who had quite a bit of trouble getting his work done. Now, I knew from talking to him and listening to him in class that he was a very bright young man, but he was just so much slower than everybody else. It wasn't until we had finished almost the entire year that I discovered why. We got to talking one day and he said, you know, when I first came, he came from some inter-American country. I don't remember which one, but he said, I knew how to speak English, but I had always gone to school throughout my life and had classes in Spanish. And so although it was easy for me to translate the concepts I was learning, when it came to difficult concepts, before I could understand them, I had to translate them, at least in my mind, from English to Spanish. And then I understood, only after I translated. No wonder it took him so long to get his work done. And so today I would like for you to do a little translating. I'm convinced that many people have reservations and questions about Christianity because they have not yet understood it. And so I'm going to ask you to do some translating. You know, when we look at movies and TV and music today, any kind of medium, sin is often presented to appear very glamorous or else it's kind of portrayed in a way that doesn't make it look very bad, very sinful. And sometimes we can be attracted to sin. It can entice us. And so we get the wrong idea of just how offensive sin really is. And so whenever you hear the word sin mentioned, think instead self-centeredness. Because really, do you admire self-centeredness? Is that what you want to live for? And instead of love sounding like something feminine or something romantic or something weak or something vague, instead just call it other-centeredness. Because really, when you translate it, isn't other-centeredness the kind of philosophy that you admire most? And when you go through that translating process in your mind, perhaps you could see this morning Christianity in a completely new and different light. And doesn't that kind of Christianity make a lot of sense? Love is other-centeredness. There's something worth dedicating your life to, worth giving your life for. We're saying this morning that love is the greatest. Love is greater than talent. As a matter of fact, the very greatest gifts are valueless without love. Let's read it here in verse 2. We're in 1 Corinthians 13. And now verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy... And understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. What a list Paul presents here. Look at it. If I have the gift of prophecy, if I have the gift of knowledge, any school student that doesn't wish they had more of that gift, that's a good one. 
if I had the gift of miracle working, if I had all of these gifts and didn't have love, what does Paul say? I am nothing. Now, many years ago, we used to have a hamster, and we called her Pumpkin. And one day I looked down into her cage and I saw those teeth that were able to nibble away so rapidly. Wonderful teeth that hamster had. I looked at her feet that could hold on to almost anything. Little pink palms, almost like a miniature little human hand. And then I saw her soft fur hiding those muscles that were able to react so quickly no human being could duplicate. She could jump and be there almost faster than your eye could follow. I saw those elastic cheeks in which she could put a week's supply of food, and that's something you can't do either. And I looked down in admiration and respect for the beautiful equipment that God had given this little animal. And then I reached down and I picked her up. And I took her out and I buried her because she was dead. She had grown old and died. And she still had all of that wonderful equipment, but without the inner spark of life, it was nothing. And I don't know how many talents God has given you, but Paul says this morning, it doesn't make any difference if you were given the gift of being a prophet or the gift of knowledge. You might be the smartest one sitting here in church today, but without the gift of love, it is nothing. That's why we get into so much trouble in courtship. We're attracted to somebody who has so many lovely externals. Forgive me, they have all of the equipment. We might be attracted to their intelligence as we get to know them better. We might be attracted to their sense of humor or the fact that maybe they can provide a need that I have in my life. And we get married, and too late we find out there's very little of the warmth of true other-centeredness down inside. And Paul says, if you don't have that, you have nothing. As a matter of fact, we're talking now about talents not being any good without love. The truth of the matter is that whatever talents you have will be abused if you don't have the gift of love. I want to make a sandwich this morning. And everybody knows you have basic parts to a sandwich, right? You have to have that piece of bread on the bottom, and you got a piece of bread on top, and you get all that good stuff in the middle. Paul makes a sandwich here in his letter to the Corinthians. He starts with the first slice, the bottom layer. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the gifts of the Spirit. And one of those gifts of the Spirit is the gift of tongues. All the gifts that he lists, beautiful gifts. The top layer, the other slice of bread, if you will, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. That chapter talks about mostly about the abuse of that very same gift of tongues. And how people were using that gift of tongues selfishly. Why? Because all the goodies had been left out. And what goes between 12 and 14? 1 Corinthians 13. Love. The goodies had been left out, and it was a bad sandwich. 1 Corinthians 13 comes between the giving of the gift and the exercise of the gift. The goodies in between 
other-centeredness, love. What Paul is saying in his sandwich is if you have gifts, but you don't have love, you will abuse those gifts. You'll use them just to attract attention to yourself, and you'll be a nuisance to your world instead of a blessing. Any gift without love just gets on people's nerves. Notice it again in verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Philip's version translation says blaring brass or clashing cymbal. Anybody here ever live with a three-year-old, a four-year-old who got a horn or a drum for Christmas? That's what he's talking about. You know, those are the kind of gifts you give to somebody else's kids. <laughs> you know, those of us that are more experienced, you're not going to buy that for your own kids. No, but it's a nice gift to give to somebody else, to the grandkids. That's what he's talking about here. When you have the gift of the instrument, but you don't have the musicianship, you've got nothing but raw nerves. And if you have the gift and you don't have the love, you just rub everybody raw. And some Christians go along all through life thinking everybody must be jealous of me because of my great gifts. Just blowing your own horn, banging your own drum. Everybody check out my talents. Check out my gifts. Maybe instead you are simply rubbing everybody raw because although you have those gifts, you don't have love. Paul says that gifts without love just aggravates. Love is the greatest. Love is greater than deeds. Verse 3. Let's look at the first part of verse 3. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Well, that sounds pretty nice. By the way, in the original Greek, the word bestow means to continuously bestow. This isn't somebody that just makes a large donation just before income tax time to get a nice tax break. Here's a person who is a continuous giver. And notice, though I bestow all, this person is also a sacrificial giver. Surely, if you are a continuous giver and a sacrificial giver, you must be a good giver. Not necessarily. Two commendable ways of giving are meaningless without love. Even in our giving, we must learn to give like Christ gives to us. His hands are always filled with gifts because his heart is always filled with love. Zeal without love is valueless. Notice the next person described here in verse 3, the last part or the middle part of verse 3. Though I give my body to be burned. Oh, come on now. I could believe so strongly in my God that I would actually give myself up as a martyr for his cause, and I could still be self-centered? It's possible, says Paul. History records the story of one Christian at Antioch who is being led to martyrdom. And a fellow Christian stopped him along the way, and he said, Please, before you go, make that thing right with your brother. But he could not. And he went to martyrdom, unwilling and unable to express love to his fellow man. Though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Talking about being zealous for God, over the years I've been approached by some, typically at camp meeting and then on the Adventist University campus where I went to school, 
where there's a large grouping of Adventists in one place. You know, you see these kind of offshoots, groups that have some different ideas that they want to share. They want to try to target, you know, those who are attending church. And they may stand outside of the church and have some pamphlets they want to give you or try to engage you in conversation and convince you that they have some new truth or something they want to add. And sometimes they're more aggressive and they'll be very critical of the church or attack the church in these days through online criticism. And these kind of reform movements typically targeted at church members. I've seen those at times, and I'm not going to tell you this morning what to read or what to listen to, but I would like to suggest to you how to read and how to listen when somebody approaches you like this. How do you tell? Is it the truth? I think Paul is giving us the answer this morning. Beware of reformers that are bitter toward their brethren. You read or you listen just far enough until even if it's carefully hidden, you find that feeling of anger or antagonism or resentment or unlovingness toward the brethren or toward the leadership of the church. And then you can safely say, well, that could not be Christian. Because Jesus said, by this shall all know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John 13, 35, watch out for vegetarians who eat people. <laughs> love is the greatest. Love is greater because it lasts. Would you look at verse 8 with me? 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 8. Charity never faileth, for whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. The one thing that lasts, according to this verse, is charity, or love, or other-centeredness. Love is possibly the only exception to man's rejecting instinct. Did you know that we all have a built-in rejecting instinct while we're on this world? We see that with children, like I mentioned earlier. You know, I remember we, for the last number of years, when my children were getting older and some were beginning to leave home, we kind of stopped the whole idea of just buying a lot of gifts and putting them under the tree. We just decided we would pick a charity and we would just donate to that and give because we are blessed with so much. And there's so many that are in need. But back in the day, we, when our children were quite young, we had seven children. And so there were a lot of gifts under the tree. And it would take a good while to open them all up. But I remember one Christmas in particular, and all the gifts had been opened. And the children were picking which ones they wanted to play with first and everything. And within a couple hours, what we noticed was very interesting. Here they were playing with a couple of laundry baskets. <laughs> that we already had in the house. And they were just having the most fun crawling underneath and making it their little fort and just having the most wonderful time with a couple of laundry baskets. And I thought all of this money that we spent on the gifts is, really? They were exercising their built-in rejecting instinct. You ladies know that. You ladies used to probably enjoy making mud pies, and hopefully you moved on to tastier fare. <laughs> Remember how you used to climb in trees and swing from the branches? Probably don't do so much of that anymore, do you? You outgrew it. You were exercising your rejecting instinct. You fellows remember that car or that pickup that you just absolutely had to have, and then you got it, and wasn't very long before you were looking at some other ones. You were exercising the rejecting instinct. Now, I remember as a <clears throat> boy, I think I was about six or so, I had an older brother and an older sister. 
And those two had the responsibility of washing all the dishes in the family. They would take turns alternating. And I felt kind of left out. I was really sad about that. I couldn't wait until I got a little bit older and that I could be asked to do the dishes. And so finally one day, the frustration just got, I just couldn't wait. And I said, I'll tell you what, I will start washing dishes if you allow me to. I will wash them for a whole year. My brother and my sister loved me in that moment. <laughs> And they encouraged my parents to accept that offer. <laughs> and that was one of the longest years of my young life. <laughs> Perhaps you can remember back as you grew toward four or five, six years old, there came a time when you absolutely just couldn't live another day until you got to start school, kindergarten or first grade. Some of you have outgrown that. And finally, you got into the eighth grade and you couldn't stand a bit more of grade school. It had to be high school now. That's where the action was. And you got to be a senior in high school and it got so boring you were pulling your hair out. College is going to be so much better. And then you couldn't wait to get through college and begin a career and start a family. Man has a natural rejecting instinct. We outgrow, we become bored with almost everything in life. Sadly, it happens in marriage as well. You fellows remember when you couldn't bear to be apart for even one night without her. And yet too many times it comes even into marriage, we find out that it's not all we dreamed it was going to be. Remember that happy moment when you became a parent. And yet as time went by, there came some moments when you were not so sure it had been a good idea from the very beginning. <laughs> it's just natural with human nature. Anticipation is greater than realization. Virtually anything and everything we can get tired of, we can get bored with, we can outgrow except love. Charity never faileth. Love is the one thing where the fun never fades. Oh, the love can fade, but the fun, if we have the love, never ever gets old. Now, I'm sure if you've been a Christian for a while, you've thought about what's heaven going to be like. You know, we all imagine, I mean, we understand that I have not seen nor ear heard nor entered to the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. That's going to be exciting to find out what God has in store for us. I can't wait to see what he has in store for me. But I've thought about kind of what my priorities would be when I get to heaven or what I would get to do and what heaven would be like. And of course, one of the first things, especially as I've gotten older, is to be reunited with loved ones. You know, I just, uh, what, a year and a half ago, lost my older brother. Before that, I lost both of my parents. My mother was still in her 50s. And just the idea of being reunited with those that I love is gonna be something really special. And as I get older, I have neighbors, I have church family, I have so many other people people that I worked with during my career that have lost their lives and I'll have a chance to be reunited with them. And what will be wonderful to, to meet great Bible characters, Joseph and Daniel, probably my two favorite Bible characters and be able to see them and talk with them about their experiences and to just have a conversation with them, what will be wonderful. And then the ultimate, of course, is to meet Jesus and to kneel down at his feet and to thank him for his salvation, for his love, for his forgiveness, for his mercy, and worship him. But aside from that, as we get kind of settled into heaven, I can picture myself gardening. That's kind of my biggest passion here on this earth. And I'm asking for much, but I think the Lord will give me maybe just a small planet that I could just have and maybe spend a couple million years just developing that. I, 
I think that would be so much fun. I wouldn't have to worry about the seasons, you know, like it's too cold to plant this, or, or we live in too cold a climate, or it gets too hot, or there's weeds, or there's pests, or there's diseases that I have to deal with here. And I won't have to worry about any of that. It's going to be so much fun to garden in heaven. And I can imagine myself maybe going down that road for a while, maybe for a really long while. But imagine that we've been in heaven for a very long time. And somehow, after the newness wears off, we become bored with heaven. And all we have to look forward to is endless, everlasting, eternal boredom. Not if we have love, Paul says. And that's what Paul is telling us. Charity never faileth. Love is the one goal. It's the one aim. It's the one dream in life that will never leave you, that will never let you down, that will never sell you short. Please, please, dear worshiper this morning, don't waste your life on anything that will eventually let you down. And so you see, it's true. Love is the greatest. Love is other-centeredness. It's greater than talent. It's greater than good deeds. It's the only thing that really lasts. What a beautiful place heaven will be where everyone is filled with other-centeredness and not one selfish person will be there. I'm going to ask you this week to join me in an experiment. I wish you would take it seriously. When the preacher talks about love, big deal, I've always believed in love. Yes, but you haven't always done it. We all fall short. Other-centeredness is love in action. It's charity. It's giving. Other-centeredness is love in action. Would you try with me an experiment this week? And here it is. No matter how busy you get, make sure that love comes first. No matter how ornery or mean or nasty somebody becomes toward you. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe a fellow student. Maybe someone at work, maybe even your spouse or someone in your family is disagreeable. Maybe even a church member. No matter how they are treating you, try loving them back. Because love works. Love is the greatest. And love comes only only from God. John tells us in 1 John 4, verses 7 to 12, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. I want to have my love perfected. I want the love of Jesus in my heart. Let us pray. Dear loving Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you loved us so much that you gave Jesus to us to save us from our sins 
And Lord, as we receive your love day by day, and we draw closer and closer to you, we know that you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, will change us, that you will change our hearts of stone and our hearts of flesh that you will make us more loving, you will make us more kind, you will make us other-centered. Lord, bless each one of us today, individually in our families, in our church family, and all of our communication with others, that we may show to others your perfect love. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.